dad looked me right in the face and he said, Jim, I did it and she deserved it. That's another test if you've forgiven somebody is if you can actually pray for the person that's offended you or hurt you. That's, that's a good sign. Our story really starts at home. Uh, I, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. I'm one of three brothers. I have two younger brothers named Oscar and Lewis. My name is Jim. And my parents were, they worked in the church. My dad was the music minister at a church in San Antonio, Texas. My mom was the church piano player. And we grew up very, I'm gonna say sheltered, but happy and it was all about church and family, and my grandparents also lived in, in, in the same city. And we thought everything was fine. Uh, but when I was in about sixth grade, my mom and dad shared with us that they were gonna get a divorce. We didn't know what a divorce was because nobody in my family had ever been divorced. And through our divorce with our parents, we went through a custody battle and custody fights and kind of bounced between house to house. and. About a year later, my dad went out of town and my brothers and I were supposed to be with my mom, but we ended up staying with some friends at the last minute, kind of a change. And over that weekend, uh, my mom was, well, she was found in her car in a deserted parking lot. Apparently two men had robbed her at gunpoint. They stole her purse. Uh, they stole her jewelry off of her. And then both of these men uh, raped my mom in the back seat of her car. And then one of the men uh, took a gun and shot my mom in the face three times. And they left my mom on the back seat floorboard of her car. And the next day after she was found, my, my dad flew home and he, he came and got us and he, and he sat us down and he shared with us about how my mom had been murdered. And all of a sudden this, this fear attached to myself and my brothers. We couldn't believe that anybody would want to kill my mom. We didn't understand why they would do it. Are they going to come after us? And it was just a fear that attaches to us. And we, we went through a, a funeral, and then for the next year, we were trying to get back to normal living with my dad. But what I've learned, if you're a victim of a crime, there, especially of a homicide, normal never returns. And so we were, we were living with my dad, and about a year later, he had a side business, he had a construction business, and two of his employees were arrested along with my dad. My dad was arrested for capital murder and criminal solicitation for hiring these two men to kill my mom. But my dad said he didn't do it. And as typical with a lot of inmates, they both blamed each other. One blamed the other, the other blamed the other one. And one of them said he overheard my dad hiring the other guy. My dad's bail was denied, and, and that's when everything changed. All of a sudden, when my mom was murdered, we were victims' kids. People, especially in church, they want to help you. They want to help us through the process. They were very giving and kind. But when my dad was arrested, e even though he said he didn't do it, all of a sudden, we got treated differently. You know, people would describe us as, you know, damaged goods or they're not going to amount to anything. And, and, and all, there's just a stigma of being an offender's kid. Well, we moved in with my aunt and uncle and we started high school in Austin, Texas. And about two and a half years later, my dad finally got his trial. 
And, and through that two and a half years, we'd visit my dad in the county jail in San Antonio. And um, we, we loved my dad. We wanted to see him. And so um, we, we went through that process of having a family member inside jail. It's really hard for the, the inmate's family because they're, you know, it's on the news, it's in the newspaper. There's, there's such a shame of having a family member in jail. Well, my dad finally gets his trial. He is found guilty of capital murder and criminal solicitation. And the jury sentenced my dad to the death penalty to be executed. Well, it was, it was heartbreaking, but I didn't believe it. Right, I just couldn't imagine that my dad would do that. You know, being my football coach, watching football together, always doing stuff together. I just never imagined that he could have could have done that and would and just thought it was all a big lie for so long. I remember we were they sat us down in the room and told us that she had been killed and shot and I just remember crying. I remember you crying. I mean you didn't cry that much growing up, so I was like this is horrible, and then Oscar's crying. So, I don't know, it was just it was kind of unbelief. Just I couldn't believe it had happened and didn't quite understand what had happened, but I knew I was scared to death. Mom was murdered. We lived in San Antonio. And, and then a year, it wasn't until a year later that Dad was arrested and we were in San Antonio. And then all of a sudden when Dad got arrested, uh, you know, being the, the the same name, I'm I'm James Jr. He was James Senior. It was in all the news media, and it was in the newspaper. It was on TV, and then um, we moved in with my aunt and uncle in Austin, and it would hit the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, all of a sudden, everybody at school knew that Dad was awaiting a capital murder trial. We never talked about it in school, but I, I, I could feel that people knew. Um, again, it was embarrassing. I mean, we'd get the paper at the house, I'd see there's pictures right there on the front page. I mean, it was, it was a, I don't know, it was just a weird way to grow up. It mm -hmm. was like almost unreal to see your father arrested and it's on the print or hearing about, reading about how she died. And, you know, and it was always on the radio and the news. And so, uh, yeah, it's just, to this day, it's just unbelievable that. We actually went through it mm -hmm. and had to live it while it's, well, it's almost like a bad TV movie. We ran. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was hard, embarrassing. I keep, that's the word that always comes up to me, shamed. Shameful that, you know, we're, her dad did this to us, so. I realize now why I keep my circle of friend small, circle of friendship small, people I hang out with, because back in school, during that time, I never wanted to talk to anybody. Right, I didn't want anybody asking me questions. I didn't want to have to answer any questions. I didn't want to have to deal with it. And I think that's where I really started shutting down during that time. Uh, but I think that's why to this day, even as I still have a small group of people that I associate with, I'm not a large group of person. And as y'all know, I not, do not enjoy being around big crowds of people and stuff like that. And so my dad was transferred to the LS unit in Huntsville, Texas to await execution. We, we then left Austin, Texas and moved in with my grandparents in Malvern, Arkansas. And we finished high school, we went to college. And it was my senior year in college, the district attorney on my dad's case, his assistant came forward and said, there's some men on death row that shouldn't be there. And she disclosed that the, the prosecutor had altered evidence in my dad's case to prove he was guilty. He knew he was guilty, he just couldn't prove it. So he changed some evidence. Well, the good news for us is we had believed in my dad and the fact that he got a new trial because of this misconduct just further reinforced that 
my brothers and I knew he didn't do it. We had kept the faith that he didn't do this. So he gets off death row when I was a senior in college, and he goes back to the San Antonio, Texas County Jail. We await the second trial. It happened about, oh gosh, four years later. And now I'm 26 years old. Uh, my brothers and I are gonna go to my dad's trial. We're gonna testify for him. And he has a second capital murder trial. Well, the jury found him not guilty of capital murder, which meant he would never be executed. And I can't describe the relief it is to know that I was not gonna lose my dad to an execution but they found him guilty of the lesser charge of murder and gave him life in prison. But the jury knew that he was getting released on parole, so they're basically releasing him, even though they found him guilty of murder. If you're a family member of an inmate, it's, it's like your life is on hold until that family member gets released. And we had done all we could over all these years to get my dad home. So that night, we knew my dad was gonna be released within the next three days on parole. In fact, uh, my wife, Meryl, and I, uh, we had, I had testified that he was gonna come live with us. And so that night, my wife and I and my dad's attorney, we all met in the, in the Bear County Jail in San Antonio, Texas, and we were so excited, but, but I had a list of questions. There's so many things that come out during a trial. And so I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I have a few questions and I just need to get some clarification on some things, and he said, Jim, ask me anything. And I get to this one particular question. My dad looked me right in the face and he said, Jim, I did it, and she deserved it. And I was shocked. He, he was confessing, and what I was really surprised by is that he was blaming it on her. He thought he was the victim because he was in prison. And I, I, I quickly, I would say, turned, flipped, changed. All of a sudden, I wanted him to know that he wasn't the victim. My mom, who was buried, is the victim. And so I left there furious. And what I realized is that was the first time I grieved for my mom. Because when my dad got arrested, it all became about him. And we had fought so many years to try to get him out of jail. And now here he was, he had been lying to us this whole time. I can't describe the betrayal that my brothers and I felt knowing that my dad had lied to us all these years and he's about to be released and he's not even sorry about it. He's blaming it on her. Well, we protested his parole, both my brothers, our family, uh, both sides, my mom and my dad's family, all protested his parole and the parole board revoted and denied my dad parole. Well, I went back to the county jail and I said, Dad, you're not getting out. You're going back to a maximum security prison, but you're not going back to death row. Death row is safe because you're isolated. You're going to a maximum security prison for life and you will never see us again. And I will tell you, my brothers and I, we had visited him. We had put money on his account at the prison. We had written letters. We had. He was a big part of our lives for all those years. He was on death row and in the county jail, and now we were turning our backs on him. And so I left that day and I said, Dad, you will never see me again. And about three years went by and uh, myself and, and one of my brothers, we had our first son and um, I remember thinking, how did my dad, who at one time was a leader in a church, married to an attractive lady, had three good boys, how does he go from a happy family man to a killer? And it bothered me because what we found out is that he had also hired these two men to kill my brothers and I. And so I went back to see him uh, three years after no contact that he had been on, on general population. 
And when I first saw him, the first thing he did was he apologized. He said he was sorry for what he did to me and what he did to my mom and what he did to my two brothers. And and I, I just, honestly, I didn't believe it. But one of the things that I learned from that is he was a man that had never, ever said he was sorry. But what I got from that is when you hear somebody say they're sorry, you start healing. <laughs> and I didn't want any part of that. And uh, so the next thing he shared with me, he said, Jim, I finally gave my life to God and I'd become a Christian after I hit rock bottom in prison. Basically, for the next year, once a month, I would go visit my dad. And through that one-year process every month, I went through a forgiveness process. And people will say, how in the world do you forgive your dad for killing your mom? But I, I work with a lot of uh, crime victims. And what I've learned is if you don't forgive your offender or somebody that's hurt you, you become bitter, angry, and depressed. And I didn't want my dad to control me. <laughs> and so I actually forgave my dad not to let him off the hook, but to let me off the hook. I didn't want to be that bitter, angry, depressed man. So even though we had reconciled a relationship, I'm still my mother's son, so I got to speak up for my mom. You don't kill my mom. That's not right. And so we had gone through and really worked out this process, and I really saw really a life change in my dad over that year. Well, I got a phone call one day about a year later from the chaplain at the Ellis unit in Huntsville, Texas, that my dad had had a brain aneurysm, and I needed to get down there quickly. Uh, my, my brother Oscar went with me. He said, I don't want to see him, but I'll go with you. My brother Lewis said, I don't even want to go. And so he didn't. And so Oscar and I headed down to the prison hospital. And by the time we got there, he was, he was brain dead. He had a brain aneurysm that popped in his brain. So we had to pull him off life support that night. And you would think that'd be easy, but he was still my dad. You know, I mean, he did kill my mom, but he was my dad, and I love my dad. We made that difficult decision. He died that night in, in prison, in the prison hospital. And what happens is if you're a, a family member of an inmate that dies in prison, you either let the inmate get buried in the prison grounds or the family can claim the body and have a private funeral at our expense. And so that's what we did. My brothers and I claimed our, our, our dad's body because we didn't want the legacy of having my dad buried on a Texas prison property. We, we had a private funeral service in San Antonio and the warden and the chaplain were there. And I knew that was odd. Wardens and chaplains don't go to inmates' funerals. Well, what we had found out was the warden was there to tell us that he had gotten approval for the first time ever in the Texas prison history, this was in 1994, that my dad was gonna have a memorial service inside the prison chapel. So about a week later, um, my brothers Oscar and Lewis and our wives headed to the Ellis unit and we were able to tour death row where my dad had lived and then we also toured the general population cell that he had lived. And then we went to the prison chapel. And it looked like a normal church chapel, except we sat on the very front row, and behind us were about 300 prison inmates in white uniforms surrounded by guard. For the next three hours, one by one, a man in a white prison uniform walked up to the microphone looked us straight in the face and said, I became a Christian because your dad shared his faith with me and I've changed my life. And when you hear one person say that, it's powerful, but when you hear 300 men over a three hour period 
share how they became a Christian because my dad shared his story. He, he would meet a man in prison. He would explain that he had made all these bad choices, had been convicted and was given a life sentence, but he had asked God for forgiveness and he had taken responsibility and accountability for his actions and he was going in a new direction. He was telling his story. We left that day, I, I started speaking in churches, sharing the story of life change and restoration of my dad and how we went through a forgiveness process. And I started then volunteering with uh, Texas Victim Services, just sharing my story inside prisons of what happened to my mom and what happened to my dad. And, and then one day I was out on a panel, a victim impact panel, and met a staff person on Bridges to Life. And I actually started as a Bridges to Life crime victim speaker and started going through their 14-week restorative justice program where there's different topics, accountability, responsibility, confession, repentance, forgiveness. And, and, and I attended a graduation of Bridges to Life. And what I realized in a graduation ceremony, all the graduates of the Bridges to Life program walk up to a microphone and they share how they changed, what they learned. And it was a picture of like my dad's memorial service in prison. And, and it really struck me, people can change. One of the hardest things uh, for me was when I met with um, mom shooter, Charles, who, who shot her three times in the face. And I remember meeting with him and really talking about all the details of how mom died. And uh, Charles told me when they pulled up that, you know, he pulled a gun on her, made her climb into the back seat of her car. The other man hopped in the front seat. And his first question to mom was, where are your boys? As he's holding the gun to her head in her own back seat. And for me, that was when I knew for sure that dad really did hire them to kill three of us. Well, I mean, it was tough to hear when you told us. I, I, my first reaction was, was that part of the bigger plan to go have another life and start over again because he didn't like the life that he had with mom and the three of us. And so I just had a lot of emotions around. And it was just, it just, again, it just brought back all the bad memories. But I still, to this day, I mean, like I said, I don't talk about him anymore. I don't think about him anymore. But I think that's why I am who I am when I got married and had Judson. It's like, I don't want to be that type of person. When you have your own child, you would die for that child, mm -hmm. let alone kill it. Yeah, that was, the, that was the hardest thing for me is, you know, when Bryce was born, our son, I'm like, it should be a happy moment, but I'm sitting there going, can I ever kill him? Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's just hard. It's just hard. And and I remember in the in the in the Bible it says you're you know how often are you supposed to forgive somebody? And there's a scripture that talks about seventy times seven. You know how is it one time seven times? No, it's seventy times seven. And I think for me and I think for you, all of us is we have to constantly forgive. I think because of our experience of having a horrible dad has really made us much better husbands, much better dads, because we were intentional on making sure they didn't experience what we experienced. There's something about forgiveness, I think, that makes us better husbands and dads. So what I, kind of the, the ending of our story is we've been able to see how God took a horrible situation with my mom's murder, but yet he turned it to good. And, and a lot of it is telling your story. Um, myself, I tell my story in, in prisons, but what, what I've learned is God can take a horrible situation in your life and he can turn it for good. And um, that just gives us a peace. And so now when I go into prisons to share our story of what happened to my brothers and I, 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 
I really get to honor our parents. I get to honor my mom and the impact she had on our life, but I also get to honor my dad, that he was a man that really did change and, and we were able to forgive him. Problems, worries, sadness. Are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear. 